Welcome to The Holy Post. On today's episode, we explore why some conservatives, including Christian thinkers, are flirting with fascism. They say that America's ideals of freedom and liberty have actually allowed progressive and non-Christian ideas to destroy our culture, and it's better to abandon those ideas and use the government to force the country to be more Christian. Are they right, or is this a complete repudiation of everything we stand for? Then, Phil talks about a new article that actually brought him to tears about what happened at the southern border under the Trump administration, and argues that this is why we have to care about the character of our leaders. Then I talk to Dr. Richard Mao about his new book, How to Be a Patriotic Christian, Love of Country as Love of Neighbor. One more thing before we jump into the episode, this Friday we're releasing a new episode of our special series, What in the World, where I talk to a different global Christian leader about a different aspect of the faith that we need to think about as American Christians. This week, the topic is the image of God and the seduction of idolatry, so don't miss that episode. Okay, here is Holy Post 521. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil. This is the Holy Post podcast. I am here with Caitlin Shess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. Hi, and Sky Jatani, or as you were, you were named several times at the Okaboji Bible Conference last week, Sky Jathani. Whatever. Mm, just Sky. Whatever. My goal is to just be Sky, like share. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mono. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Caitlin's huh. doing so well. She might be closer to being just Caitlin than no, you know, Sky you is so much sky. more of a distinctive name. Caitlin. Kate, Caitlin is like the Jessica of '90s babies, with a with with a K though. Or were there a lot of C's? Oh no, there's so A's? many spellings. There's like 25 oh, yeah. spellings. Yeah, there's yeah. like 25. You need to come up, change your name to a new spelling that no one has. You know, like with a J and an L and a P in it. I already have the worst last name to spell, so I don't think that oh, would help. You should drop all the vowels, like like the weekend. Yeah, K T L. <laughs> Can you use and, a Y or is a sometimes Y? So can we use the Y? That's that's operating as a vowel though. Okay, but you can't use the Y. KTLN. Clun. Clun. It's like yeah, it sounds like a radio station. KTLN, KTLN in Cincinnati. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Well, it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin's writing her book. Sky and Phil, we're at the Bible conference in Iowa. We're all back. Sky did the morning Bible hour. How did that go? It was about what What if Jesus was serious about the church, your newest book. Was it mm-hmm. well received? I think so. I mean, I didn't, you know, no one came up and threatened me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'd call that a victory. That's better than <laughs> better than prior years. And and Caitlin, you said you're actually getting close to being done with your book? It is due September 1st and and classes yeah. for me start the next day. Oh. So I need I need to be done on you September 1st. You need to hit your deadline. Okay. Yeah. Well, have a fun, relaxing August, <laughs> Caitlin. Okay. Uh, I have two big stories, so we have to jump into it because time's a waste and, and, and Sky's internet has already died once in the middle of our recording. And who, may, who knows how many more times Sky will just leave us randomly. How the American right fell in love with Hungary. I don't know if you noticed, but something weird happened at um, a big conservative get-together Last week, I think, the CPAC in Dallas, one of the keynote speakers was the prime minister of Hungary, who is not terribly popular with people that are fans of liberal democracy, because he is not really a fan of liberal democracy. Um, He had fun at his CPAC appearance. He, he, um, two weeks ago, gave a speech where he said that Hungarians do not want to uh, to become peoples of mixed race. He is fairly anti-immigrant in his tone, somewhat Trump-like in that regard. And uh, that statement was a little bit controversial. One of his advisors quit in protest of that statement, felt it was a little bit Nazi. But (laughs) he believes, Orban believes, uh, like many people on the right in America, that globalists are driving the West to the brink of cultural suicide. He also 
openly acknowledges that conservatives cannot fight successfully by standard liberal means. His closing lines at the CPAC conference called on conservatives across the Atlantic to coordinate our troops in the fight against liberalism, exhorting them to gear up to remove Joe Biden from office. The stakes in his telling are the very future of our civilization. He said, the West is at war with itself. We have seen what kind of future the globalist ruling class has to offer, but we have a different kind of future in mind. The globalists can all go to heck. I have come to Texas. Not something you would expect to hear from the prime minister of Hungary. (laughs) Isn't the idea of a foreigner speaking in Texas kind of globalist? A little bit. But it's a new global alliance. Okay, so so like two weeks ago, I did a thing about I was diving into the deep sea of Reaganism and libertarianism and Goldwater and how Christians became so opposed to trying to solve problems through government, through state, you know, the levers of the state. We were opposed to that. We should be done at the church level or at the family level. Never at the state level, we oppose that. And that really caught on with the Reagan revolution. And I was kind of operating under the assumption that um, when we look at people like Ron DeSantis in Florida, who is a conservative, but he's, he's using the levers of government to try to, you know, fight wokeism, that he just didn't really understand that he was supposed to be conservative. And now I'm realizing, no, there is a new wave in American conservatism that is um, cresting, crashing, I don't know, but it is um, believing that here, let's, let's go to a different story. This is big right up in You're what? just giving up like that? What? You just given up? Oh no, no, no. Go to a different story about the same story. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what is happening? So, so conservatives like Tucker Carlson have been making the pilgrimage to Budapest to do shows there and to learn about the Hungarian experiment. Um Carlson's trip to Hungary was prompted. This is a story, I think, in the New York Times or New York Times magazine. Big long story. In part by Carlson's trip to Hungary was prompted in part by a text message from Rod Dreher, a conservative writer. We've talked about Rod Dreher before numerous times over the years. Uh, he wrote the book The Benedict Option, which declared uh, he's he's Christian, Orthodox Christian, as in big O Eastern Orthodox Christian, but also a conservative writer. And he declared in his book that kind of put him on the map that conservatives have lost the culture war, that progressives control all the major institutions, you know, government, finance, media, um, academia, you name it. It's over. We've lost. So what we should really do is pull back, pull back, make our own institutions, focus on our own communities, live local. Um, and kind of throw in the towel on fighting the liberals. Um, and he got fascinated with Hungary. So he actually, someone reached out to him because there's a group that is um, promoting American intellectuals, conservative intellectuals to come spend a few months in Hungary and look at what we're doing here. So Rod Dreher went to Hungary got all excited about what was going on in Hungary. So he he texted uh, Tucker Carlson, who then went to Hungary and did a whole week of Fox News shows from Budapest. So one of the big things that's focusing this group is their distaste for immigration. Um, Dreher believes, as do many in his circle of right-wing intellectuals, that high levels of immigration threaten the stability and cultural continuity of a nation. Uh, In his daily blog posts, Dreher writes mainly against what he refers to as wokeness, ideas about racial justice and gender gender identity that he believes lead Americans to hate America and children to reject their parents. So uh, Dreher admires Orban because that's Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, because he's, quote, willing to take the hard stances necessary to keep his country from losing its collective mind under assault by woke loonies. 
Dreher told me that he wanted to observe to what extent politics can be a bulwark against cultural disintegration. And this is where it gets interesting, because what these conservatives are starting to do is saying, wait a minute. What if we actually had political power? We could use the levers of the state to win the culture wars. So Dreher uh, was interviewed by this New York Times reporter and said, I realize that we're at a point now where we have such cultural disintegration in the U.S. that the choice might actually be between an illiberal democracy of the left or an illiberal democracy of the right. Okay, then this article is, is worth reading. We'll post it in the show notes because they go into some of the background of the thinkers behind this kind of new wave and many of them are Catholic and are bringing Catholic social theory into all of this. Sky, you look like you really want to say something. Yeah, I just, I, for the sake of our listeners, I think we need to take a step back and explain a little bit what this means, if okay. I may. Do it. So, so essentially what Dreher and others are saying is liberals have taken over every other institution of the society and are having massive success in turning the society toward its values. The only option left for conservatives is to take over the government. And we have a unique structure here because of the constitution that gives disproportionate amount of government power to rural areas of the country because of the electoral college and the Senate and things like that. So white conservatives in the rural part of the country can take over the government and Dreher and others are saying, essentially, we should use the power of the federal government, including law and military, to force the country to adhere to the values that we want rather than the freedom to choose for themselves. This is not the American way, period. Like this is, this is an utter rejection of what we have known for 250 years as the American way, but that's okay. what they're advocating. Okay, sky, 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 sky. I'm going to play... I'm going to play Dreher's advocate, Orban's <laughs> advocate, not okay. devil's advocate because I'm a Christian, but I'm going to play right. Dreher's right. advocate. And this is some, most of these people are like Dreher was Catholic and then converted to Orthodox um, when the, the church sex scandal was breaking. And some of the others in this movement have converted to Catholicism mm -hmm. as a part of their movement in this direction. So there, here's their point, and I think this is kind of an interesting point. Classic liberalism historically is the pursuit of individual <clears throat> liberty, you know, against yes. the state, against the king, even against the church. It was, I should be able to own property without having it seized by the king for no good reason, you know, without due process. I shouldn't be able to be arrested for heresy charges or, you know, seditious activity just because I spoke my mind. So freedom of speech, freedom of thought, those were all, that's classic liberalism, right? Yes. Okay. So their point is, their contention, and there's there's one Catholic philosopher, political philosopher that they quote extensively in this article, who is at Notre Dame University, who says basically this liberal experiment is the pursuit of maximum individual liberty without taking into uh, consideration the health of families, cities, communities. So the individual trumps all, free markets trump all, even if it means, and what we see now, they would say, is the destruction of the family, the destruction of the church, the destruction of the communities, whether it's by rampant uh, capitalism, whether it's by the ultra wealthy, or whether it's by you know the woke uh, elites telling us that you know we have to let our kids be whatever gender they want to be, and the state will take them away if you don't let them. So the argument is that individual autonomy and liberty destroys the fabric of society. That's the result. So we have to oppose it and come up with a way that takes into consideration the common good. You like that phrase, Sky. You I love do. the phrase, the common good. They point back, I'm not done yet, Sky. I'm not done. I'm still advocating for Orban or whoever I'm advocating for. 
Um, so they point to the Constitution that talks about provide for the common defense to promote the general welfare. The general welfare of society is related to the concept of common good. So the common good to be promoted sometimes must overcome liberalism, which wants individual autonomy above all. So if we want common good above all, let's look at what, say, oh, I don't know, Viktor Orban is doing in Hungary, where he's passing laws that encourage people to build larger families. He's passing laws that prevent children from being uh, having, having anything promoting LGBTQ issues. It's, it's now illegal to talk about LGBTQ issues to anyone under the age of 18. So he's taken over parts of the media so that they don't spread all this progressive leftist stuff. And he's doing it to make families stronger so that society can be Christian and healthy, even if it's illiberal, because... Don't you want a healthy society, Sky Jatani? Okay, a couple of things. Number one, I think, Caitlin, you're going to have to step in here and clearly declare a winner between me and Phil. So oh, just, okay. you know. Okay, okay. Second, okay, and then two things to respond to you, Phil, and I'll try to keep this brief. Number yes. one, the founding generation understood that the impulse of liberty, especially individual liberty, was indeed what you are saying, that it could lead to a breakdown of the common welfare, the common good, and societal uh, stability, which is why they wrote extensively about the fact that the only way a free people, a republic, could truly endure is if those people pursue virtue. And they understood that personal virtue was going to be inculcated through family and through voluntary institutions such as the church. The problem is the church has failed in America, largely. Families have failed largely in America. And as a result, we are seeing the deterioration of society and the breakdown in this radical individualism. And what Dreher and these others and Orban are saying is, well, what we then need as the solution is the government. The government needs to step in and force people to be virtuous, force people to make right decisions, force people to stay away from bad things. That is not going to lead to the virtue they want. And second point, and then I'll be done. If you think that Viktor Orban in Hungary or any other totalitarian fascist light kind of system this illiberal right, as Dreyer calls it, if you think that that kind of government is suddenly going to only and always advocate for the virtuous qualities of Christian faith and the church, you're nuts. Because at the end of the day, what these governments want is loyalty to the government, loyalty to the leader, loyalty to the dictator. And when Christian faith or a virtue comes into conflict with that, they're going to use the exact same tactics and tools against the church that they're currently seeking to use against what they call the woke elite or globalists or liberals. So this is a tiger that you cannot ride without getting bitten. And that's a, it's a Faustian bargain that you just cannot make. It's exactly what the German Lutheran church thought they were doing with the Nazis. Well, they're going to make, you know, it's all about German nationalism and it's Hitler's okay and all that. And, and then sooner or later, when Christian teaching conflicted with what the Nazis wanted, who won? The Nazis. Mm -hmm. And they turned on Bonhoeffer and they turned on others. That's what they're talking about here. They think that we have a common enemy, so let's get in bed with Orban and, and the fascists. But it's it's a terrible bargain. Okay. Well, well, the Dreher in me would push back on your classification of Orban as a fascist. That's I said he's a fascist light. Language. Fascist, fascist light. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Notre Dame political mm -hmm. philosopher Patrick Deenan wrote the book Why Liberalism Failed. He argued that the antidote to the disenchantments of modern liberal society was to be found in the closeness and custom of local communities. Rather than retreat from society, it might be possible to actually reshape it with the help of Catholic thought. Okay, Caitlin, that's not bad. Reshape society with the help of Catholic thought. Yeah. <laughs> Tell Sky, um, that's not bad. I, I want okay, Caitlin's well, point of view here. I really, I, really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, two main things that I want to say. One, I do think it's important and for Protestants who are unfamiliar with Catholic social teaching to spend time thinking about what this looks like on a more foundational level, um, because there's this kind of conservative version or appropriation of it that is very illiberal. 
And there is an element of like historic Catholic teaching about the state that is in a sense very illiberal. It's the idea that there is a close relationship between the church and the state. And the state is instructed in Christian teaching by the church and the church is superior to the state. And so the church can kind of tell the state what to do. And different iterations of that in different countries throughout history has been a mess. So we have good reasons to be critical at times of it. Um, and yet there's moments in this article that that you sent us, Phil, that that point to the ways that this doesn't fit along exactly partisan lines in the sense that people like Patrick Deneen are talking about the ways that, you know, liberalism and capitalism have abstracted people away from close-knit communities, the way that capitalism, for all of the conservatives' love of it, ends up actually destroying families and communities in some pretty profound ways. And that's one of the the blessings of, of Catholic teaching on these things, is that there's a really holistic way of looking at human life that doesn't actually fit very neatly into partisan pockets. But I, I think the the point here about liberalism that's important for people to understand is there's both liberalism in kind of the procedural sense and the, the sense that a lot of us benefit from, that the state can't infringe on certain rights, that we have the ability to, to hold the state accountable for those things. And then there's liberalism as an ideology, which a lot of these people are talking about, that I think most Christians should be suspicious, if not you know entirely critical of, that says that you can kind of abstract people away from their really foundational beliefs and just see them as individual wills operating in the world and kind of fighting out for competing interests and wants to kind of rid the public square of more religious, more transcendent kind of claims to truth or reality. And that's a problem. But what this misses is the fact that there there can be both in small scale and larger scale, lower D democratic ways of both handling those very sincere differences in how we think about big theological philosophical questions and that they can work within liberalism's procedures in a way that doesn't have to come along with liberalism's ideology. So you can operate in a state that has been shaped by liberal ways of thinking about humans, but push back against those ways of thinking about humans. Like you don't have to kind of capitulate to that whole ideology. And a little d democratic way of operating is really actually a, a deeply Christian way of engaging the world in the sense that one of the gifts that Protestantism especially has given us and the Christian faith in general, this isn't a you know, distinctly Protestant thing, but it's one thing that Protestants have historically emphasized, is that because the image of God is in every single person and that the spirit resides in every single believer, that there's this kind of democratizing impulse that says that we should respect those differences in people. We should respect their religious choices, but we should also respect their deeply held beliefs in all sorts of other ways. I found this article to be one of the most frightening things I've read in a long, long time because of exactly what you're saying, Caitlin. It's a... It's, it's a it's Christian saying we need to give up on mutual respect of those that we disagree with. And we are, it's a, it's a pure battle for power. That's mm-hmm. it. And either we're mm-hmm. going to be in control or they are. And it's a winner take all zero sum game. And that is frightening, especially well, you, in a, what do you in a society say, of 350 million people who are as diverse as Americans are. Yeah. yeah. What do you, what do you say though, of the view that the left, the far left is doing this already, that they're shutting down, uh, you know, freedom of speech with all the thought police and the Twitter cops and, you know, you can't well, use, say this and you have to use your pronouns. And so a lot of people said that's happening. It's happening. Two things. It's the same thing. Two things are, yes, it is happening. It is happening, but it's not yet happening on the level of the federal government. It isn't like that's, it isn't like the federal government is telling us you can't say certain things, right? It might be a woke mob on Twitter. It might be some academics in certain places, and that's problematic. But these guys are talking about taking over the federal government and using the force of the government, law and military, to push what they see as a Christian set of values on others. Number two, Yes, it's happening on the far left wing as well, but there is still this majority of Americans in the middle who hold to liberal ideals of freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of autonomy, of ownership, all these different ideas that have been with America from the beginning. And what they're doing is they're taking the extreme examples on the far left and using it to justify their extremism on the far right. And all of us who are somewhere in the middle who think it is possible for us to get along with people we disagree with and mm-hmm. share this amazing society, they're getting left out of the conversation. And that's what's wrong here. I also think that people have taken as just like common knowledge this sense that the media and Hollywood and academia are just entirely left wing kind of places. And that's true if you're only talking about 
language that we use, like, you know, making sure that we're using the right terms for things. And it might even be true if you're talking about like gender, sexuality kind of things. But when you're talking about money, if you're talking about economics, none of those spaces are like truly left in the sense that they're really thinking about those kind of socioeconomic dynamics. And the fact that a lot of people who have described kind of the world they're living in as just inhospitable to conservative beliefs are really people who just want to be able to say whatever they want without consequences. They're not seeing in the world around them just like a really left way of organizing all society. Like that's not what's happening in academia. That's not happening in the media. Like there's lots of really wealthy people who are opposed to kind of more left economic policies in all of those places. So I think what people are really seeing when they say when they say things like that is I want to be able to use whatever language I want without consequences. And I would like you to have no legal consequences for most of your speech, but there are going to be social consequences for it. And you, you know, having the ability to engage those kinds of conversations in a really loving way will probably get you further in terms of changing those kind of cancel culture dynamics than just being like, well, I'm annoyed that there are consequences and I'm just going to say whatever I want even more because I don't like those consequences. Okay. 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 Do you know who J.D. Vance is? Of yes. course. Okay. <laughs> of course. Of course. Who doesn't? My my cat knows who J.D. Vance is. <laughs> uh, he wrote the book, best-selling book, uh, Hillbilly Elegies. We've talked about that book, I think, before years ago. And then he he was a never-Trumper. He actually thought Trump could turn out to be America's Hitler. And then suddenly <laughs> now he's pro-Trump and he ran for, um, he's running for Senate in Pennsylvania and- Ohio. He, Ohio, sorry. Yeah. And he won the Republican primary against the, the incumbent. And so he might actually probably will be the next senator from the state of Ohio. So here's his views. He's become good friends with, guess who? Rod Dreher. And has, guess what? Converted to Catholicism. And guess who was at the church to celebrate his conversion to Catholicism? Rod Dreher, who's not a Catholic. But anyway, um, he, in a speech, a recent speech, Vance, this is his new position, and he's also a big fan of Viktor Orban from Hungary. Vance blamed the childless left for America's woes. He praised far-right Hungarian President Viktor Orban for encouraging married couples to have children and said, this is Vance talking, said non-parents should not have as much of a voice in society as parents and that parents should have a bigger say in how democracy functions. Um, he said, How about this, parents of more children, if you have 10 children, do you get more of a say yes, than if you have yes. two children? It's the great Mormon takeover of oh. America. Um, yeah. So he also said that left leaning foundations like the Ford Foundation should have their assets seized and redistributed to the middle class that's been destroyed by the globalists. So this is interesting. This is a conservative <laughs> Republican running for Senate saying we should seize the assets of private foundations and redistribute the wealth. Yeah, this is what this is what so would close. happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, what, what so is it's a little the difference? Crazy. It's a what little is crazy. the difference between that and somebody on the far left? I mean, really far left, like communist yeah. left saying, saying the rich. We, exactly. There's no difference. Yeah, it's, he's just saying eat the woke. So, because yeah. the Ford Foundation is promoting what he considers progressive values, we need to eat it. We need to eat the Ford Foundation and, and redistribute the wealth. Um, the foundational document of Catholic social tradition is the 1891 encyclical of Pope Leo XIII, which argued that individual freedom did little to help workers secure a living wage, and it valorized workers' associations, we call them unions, urging government to intervene to balance the economy. So, Caitlin, are you against that? Are you against the yeah. 1891 encyclical of Pope Leo XIII? I loved it. <laughs> Truly, I'm being serious. Yes. I think one of my I, favorite I, encyclicals. It is one of my favorite encyclicals. I no, seriously, I do think it's important to note, like I said before, um, especially because of America's history of anti-Catholicism, um, that like this particular iteration of it that Roger represents is not the whole of, especially Roger in particular, does not represent like the whole tradition of Catholic social teaching or the whole tradition. I mean. The, the range of theological opinions among Catholics is wider than most Protestants 
tend to think. Um, but also, even those two encyclicals that get mentioned in that article have these really important, like more holistic ways of thinking about human life that are not represented by the, including, um, you know, I talked a few weeks ago about Laudato Si, one of the more recent encyclicals by Pope Francis, that's talking about the need for, for governments to have more holistic ways of thinking about both the environment and the economy to prioritize both families and ecological life that we are inheritors of from past generations and hand on to further generations. So to, to kind of take some of these thinkers as representative of all Catholic thinking about this would be to warp what it really is. I You know, going back to that encyclical, Extreme individualism is a scourge on society. It absolutely is. That's not the question. The thing is, I would prefer to see the church and the family as a mitigating force that that confines and limits individualism rather than the federal government. That's what this comes down to, is these, these folks on the far right now are saying, we want the federal government to do the work of the church. We want the federal government to do the work of the family. We want the federal government to do the work that used to be done for all these centuries in local communities and families and voluntary institutions. If the Ford, if the Ford um, Foundation, Foundation is doing is doing great harm to society, society can do something about that. Assuming it's not you know criminally harmful, they can stop you know buying Ford products. And send a message, but no, to have the federal government do that is is it's a level of power that the founders never wanted the federal government to have. Okay, so what you're saying is the federal government should not get involved in gun control because that's the job of the church, or get involved in feeding the poor because that's the job of the church. I'm not. I'm not saying no. I'm saying when it comes to radical individualism. That's what they're fighting against here. They're saying the family okay. is breaking down. We should the government should yeah. be forcing people to have children. Really? No, 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 no. Incentivizing <laughs> Sky. Give you money. I'll give you money. You get a discount on a family car in Hungary. A large family car. You get a discount if you have more kids. That's not the issue in Hungary. The issue in Hungary is that Viktor Orban has basically taken over the media so that it's become an, a propaganda arm of his government. Well, that's sometimes the, that's because the progressive left took over the media. Right. And so the pro, the okay. re regressive right has to take it back. It's it's, it's when you There's infringe, only so much power in the world, Sky. Someone has to have all the power. It's Shouldn't when you it infringe when you infringe on personal liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief, first amendment yeah. kind of stuff. That's what's being advocated for here. It's not that we should give a tax incentive to families. We already do that. We've been doing that for a long, long time. It isn't that we should make you know education more affordable. We've been doing that for a long, long time. The issue is when the government is controlling speech and voluntary association and assembly and religious conviction and practice, that's where it's gone too far. It It's also really important, something that, that article does not touch on that is foundational to Catholic social teaching is not only the idea that there are different estates that are important, the church, the civil government, and the family, but that they have um, ways of interacting in the world that are proper to it and powers proper to those estates. That's right. So the Catholic doctrine of subsidiarity, which a lot of times um, we spent my whole week in this class talking about how we've often kind of acted like it just means the lowest or like the smallest person deals with something. It's not kind of libertarian in that sense. It means that whatever is proper to that sphere should deal with it, which is up for debate then, right? Things like public education. Is that more proper to the state or is that more proper to the family or is that more proper to the church in the history of Catholic you know, education through the churches? So it's not. it doesn't mean that it's easy always to discern what is most proper to what a state, but it does mean that like integral to Catholic social teaching is something that is quite counter to this particular articulation of it, which says that there's not supposed to be a single power making decisions about things. There's supposed to be the in the sphere that is proper to have that power, it should be had, which means as Sky has described, it's especially true of, of a church that has worldwide reach and kind of has the ability to make proclamations that are more binding on people than Protestant denominations. It makes sense that that's the church that would say, we're very much against individualism and we very much care about the creation of families. And so we actually can tell families how to kind of act with each other. We can tell churches how to teach the people in their church about individualism and about how to use their money and how to build communities. Um, and we can tell the state, these are the laws we think are best. 
in the world that we live in today, we, the church doesn't have the relationship with states that it used to have, so the state can ignore what the church says about that. But that that's actually a proper way of, in our own context, in Protestant context, that's actually a pretty similar way that we tend to think about things, that the church teaches on how human communities should function, and it doesn't get to dictate as the single power what happens, but we take that teaching with us into voting booths, and we take that teaching with us into our families and our communities, and in the sphere that is proper to those powers, we dictate them as scripture and the history of the church teaches us. Okay, so the one thing I I agree, I agree, I'm no longer Dreher's advocate, and <laughs> And what concerns me about this is I, it, this will be interesting to watch this fall because we've got Republican candidates that will be running for high offices in the country that are adopting this approach of let's use the levers of state to win the culture wars. And what's interesting is that they're borrowing from Catholic social theory, but a very truncated ver version of Catholic social theory, because yeah. the one thing I notice in all of these quotes is no one is talking about the poor. No one is yeah. talking about yeah. marginalized people, except right. um, the, white, the white middle class. The white middle class is, is the marginalized uh, group that we're concerned about and want to use, you know, we want to seize all of the assets of the Ford Foundation so we can redistribute the wealth to the white middle class. Um, or so, immigration, the amount of Catholic teaching on, oh, you know, nations right. being open yeah. to foreigners. Like that's kind of important. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a biggie. And all of these, I mean, the, the, the biggest reason Orban got all this attention is that he closed the borders of Hungary. Um, to he accepted no Syrian immigrants, and you know most of his borders are closed, which is a violation of EU uh, law. And they are an EU member, so he's basically in violation. And but he hates the EU; he doesn't want to be a part and of the, the EU. And the Bible, the Bible. No, we're preserving Christian values. Yeah. We're not actually practicing Christianity. You know, mm. one thing. One thing to keep in mind is this: our country, the United States, one of its great founding ideals was we are not like Europe. We are not going to find ourselves in the sectarian, nationalistic, constant warfare that Europe has had with itself. We are not defined by a single religion. We are not defined by a single ethnic group or even language. And we welcomed from the very beginning, we welcomed people from all varieties of life. I mean, George Washington wrote letters about welcoming Muslims to this country. He, uh, Jefferson wrote a famous letter to a, a Jewish congregation, I think, in, was it Rhode Island or Connecticut, I think? Like, this has always been America. We have, mm -hmm. to, to think that now we're looking back, looking back across the Atlantic to the, to the old world to say, oh, we need to do it the way they did it. Nationalistic, close-minded, <clears throat> excuse me, close-minded, imperialistic, uh, you know, racist and divide. I mean, that's just, it's madness to me that we think that that's the right way to do it. And okay. even like, in right. this article, they, they talk about France and how France welcomed all kinds of immigrants in and North Africans and Muslims. And now they're in turmoil about that. It's because France as a society has no history of integrating people of different backgrounds mm -hmm. into its national fabric. That has always been our history. So all these conservatives who are looking at the old world as the right way to do things, they're betraying American values and heritage. It's, it's, it's an utter betrayal of the Constitution. It's a complete rejection of American society and history. And, and, and even you though they wrap hear, themselves in the flag and the Constitution, they are burning it as they pursue these values. Yeah, you will hear, in many cases, more concern about Western civilization than yeah. specifically about the American way, because the American way is wildly pluralistic. Right. You know, the American way is not about an ethno-cultural group, technically, even though we kind of want to make it one and have tried at various points in history to make America about a certain ethno-cultural group. Um, Hungary and many of the countries in Europe are very much always have been about certain ethno-cultural groups. Right. So there is a point in saying, hey, you know, Sweden for Swedes. In Germany for Germans, but you can't say America for Americans because they're, unless you're going back to the Native Americans, they're just 
is our no motto. Such thing. Our national motto is E Pluribus Unum, out of many no, one. It's in God we trust to keep us ethnoculturally oh, homogenous. Okay. Okay. I do have so this so let us know. Go to holypost.com. Let us know what you think. Read the story in the New York Times. We'll post it in the show notes. I have one more story that I want to get to before we run out of time. Um, a huge, so long article in this month's The Atlantic where, what's her name? Caitlin Dickerson is a, a reporter who did some of the uh, deep diving, early reporting on the family separation crisis going along on, on the border during the Trump administration. This was in 2017 and 2018 when kids were being separated from their parents as they came across the border. And in some cases, there was no way to reunite them because no one kept records of who went with where. So Caitlin has been, uh, Caitlin Dickerson has been doing, not our Caitlin. I told Caitlin, you there's a lot of us. <laughs> Caitlin with a C, Dickerson wrote this piece. It takes a long time to read it. It's like a book in this month's Atlantic, but you really should look it up because, oh man. Um, this is how she starts out. It says, during the year and a half in which the U.S. government separated thousands of children from their parents, the Trump administration's explanations for what was happening were deeply confusing and on many occasions patently untrue. Trump administration officials insisted for a whole year that family separations weren't happening. Finally, in the spring of 2018, they announced the implementation of a separation policy with great fanfare, as if one had not already been underway for months. Then they declared that separating families was not the goal of the policy, but an unfortunate result of prosecuting parents who crossed the border illegally with their children. Yet a mountain of evidence shows that this is explicitly false. Separating children was not just a side effect, but the intent. Instead of working to reunify families after parents were prosecuted, some officials actually worked to keep them apart for longer. Over the past year and a half, this is Caitlin Dickerson talking, I've conducted more than 150 interviews and reviewed thousands of pages of internal government documents, some of which were turned over to me only after a multi-year lawsuit. These records show that as officials were developing the policy that would ultimately tear thousands of families apart, they minimized its implications so as to obscure what they were doing. Many of these officials now insist that there had been no way to foresee all that would go wrong, but this is not true. The policy's worst outcomes were all anticipated and repeated internal and external warnings were ignored. Indeed, the records show that almost no logistical planning took place before the policy was initiated. Uh, and then she closes the intro by saying, it's been said of other Trump era projects that the administration's incompetence mitigated its malevolence. Here, the opposite happened. A flagrant failure to prepare meant that courts, detention centers, and children's shelters became dangerously overwhelmed, that parents and children were lost to each other, sometimes many states apart, that four years later, some families are still separated, and that even many of those who have been reunited have suffered irreparable harm. Um, what, the, I, didn't, I didn't read the article. You what didn't did she, read it. What does she explain as the motivation? What was the goal? Was it simply deterrence that if we separate yes. families, it'll stop people from wanting to cross the border? Yes. Yes. It was entirely And sometimes deterrence. just like, you know, outright retribution. Like it, what, it was meant to punish the parents. Yeah. Yeah. It was meant as a punitive uh, yeah. measure so that early on when in some cases the process the legal process actually happened so quickly that the parents were reunited with their kids in only a few days. Um, high, high ranking people at ICE stepped in to say, wait, 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 it needs to take longer than that. That's not long enough for this to be punitive. So, and here's what I want to raise because it's, you know, we could go in for hours, do a whole show on the different ways uh, the Trump administration tried to justify this and the different ways Christians that supported Trump have tried to say, no, no, it was just following the law. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Sessions, who was the, um, you know, the attorney, attorney, general. attorney general at the time, used the Bible to justify separating children from their parents at the border. Um, what I wanted to get into, though, is because if you read this, this is horrific. This is not very many articles I read, I'm in tears by the end, but this is one of them. 
it was horrific what the Trump administration did um, to, they estimate about 5,600 children um, separating them from their parents. And some were nursing infants. We actually separated nursing babies from their mothers forcibly and sent them to different states, put them under the, the, the possession of entirely different agencies in the government that had not set up any system to connect where they were going. I mean, it was a, it was a humanitarian disaster of a dramatic scale. And I just, Trump was in favor of it the whole time. In fact, even, this is clear if you get to the end of the article, even after it had come out how terrible it was, and yeah. everyone had demanded that it be shut down and families put back together, even after that, Trump was saying, can we turn it back on again? Can we turn on? And whereas, you know, even the people around him were calling it, this is the zero tolerance policy. It's not about family separation. It's a zero tolerance policy. Trump was calling it the family separation policy. And then we need to start it up again so that people stop coming to America. I, I don't know why anybody would be particularly surprised by that, given that there is verifiable uh, accounts of Trump trying to get the U.S. military to open fire on American protesters. Yeah. I mean, the man lacks something, criti some critical empathetic capacity. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I think there's something significantly broken in his psyche. And the fact that he doesn't feel empathy towards families and infants and the trauma that this causes is not surprising. It's consistent with what we've known. About. Even when he was a candidate back in 2015, 2016, he was openly advocating for war crimes against America's enemies, including torture. This is not somebody who understands the law or who understands human empathy, and he should yeah. never be anywhere near the Oval Office ever again. Yeah. But it, what, go ahead, Caitlin. I was going to say, I think the, the striking thing about reading that very long article is that over and over again throughout it, there are descriptions of people who to, to varying degrees felt this was wrong, who just kind of seems like they thought, well, this, this can't, this won't actually happen. Like at some point in this bureaucracy, someone will stop it or something, it won't actually work or he'll be convinced at some point. It's just like page after page of people who, again, with varying degrees, some of them mildly uncomfortable, some of them horrified, having this, this attitude that I think accurately describes a lot of voters in the 2016 and 2020 election of like some people really loved the cruelty of Trump. There's no getting around that. But I do think a lot of people who I want to believe the best of, who I think were just trying to figure out how to make a decision that to them felt very difficult, who wanted to vote for a quote unquote pro-life president, as much as I don't think that's true, who did have a similar attitude of like, yes, he said all these horrible things about immigrants. Yes, he said all these horrible things about women. But like, someone will stop him. Like the bureaucracy mm -hmm. won't let this happen. There's some kind of, and then to realize that even people who had power to do something along the way to stop it, some people did to, to varying degrees, but a lot of people, it seems like just thought that's someone else's job. Like at some point, someone will stop this. It won't actually happen. It won't actually be that bad. And the reality is it was, it was that horrific. And someone who wants to do something that evil will do it. And the idea that human broken human systems will just automatically protect people from that kind of evil is a ridiculous idea that too many of us believe when we want to have a justification for not sacrificing ourselves to stop someone from doing something evil. Right, right. Um, here's, here's what I wanted to bring up. And this is, this is why I think this story is applicable to a podcast that's about living Christianly. So many Christians justified support for Trump by saying, I'm not saying he's a good man. I'm not saying he's a moral man, but he'll be surrounded by good people, and so we'll get good policies. Okay, immoral men do not attract moral followers. Okay, he brought a whole bandwagon. I mean, just look at pictures of some of them. Roger Stone and Steve Bannon and Paul Manafort. Half of them look like they, they would be villains in the old Dick Tracy cartoons. They're just ri ridiculously sinister looking people who strive to look sinister. <laughs> um, Steve, Stephen Miller. So an immoral man brought in, swept in immoral 
lackeys, sidekicks, and and Stephen Miller is is really the villain behind the child separation policy. Yeah. Um, he wanted it. He pushed it. He went around people in different departments of the government to promote it. When when he couldn't get it through a, a boss of a government agency, he went under them to their underlings and acted like he'd already gotten the sign off from the higher ups so that he could try to get things implemented. Uh, and and that's you know that's what so many of these kind of hanger honors in the Trump administration, the Steve Bannons tried to do because they didn't really have official positions. Steve Bannon wasn't the Secretary of State. Stephen Miller was just an advisor, but he manufactured much of the immigration policy. Uh, that Donald Trump wanted. Donald Trump just wanted to be tough on immigrants. That's all. He didn't really have specific policy ideas uh, other than, can I shoot them? Is that legal? No. Well, then what can I do? And it was Stephen Miller that came up with these really terrible policies that deeply traumatized 5,600 children. So you cannot say it doesn't matter if the man is immoral the policies will somehow come out moral. We've seen that doesn't work. We need to prevent this from happening again. Caitlin, last thoughts? I just, uh, another thing that struck me while I was reading this article was how often the author did a wonderful job of, of highlighting moments when she was talking to people who were a part of creating this policy who had to step away from speaking to her because their child needed something. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that it struck me especially is because I have found myself among many Christians, um, probably people ideologically similar to the people Sky was describing, who would do anything for their own children. And it's ironic. We're, we've talked multiple times in the podcast about parents, you know, fighting for their kids to not be exposed to CRT in the classroom or like, you know, evangelical Christians especially have this reputation of being pro family, fighting for their kids, protecting their kids. And it is a deeply Christian idea to think that you have an obligation beyond your immediate family. Um, and if we are not learning that in our churches, learning that, for Christians, there's no such thing as other people's children, that you have an obligation to the hurting, vulnerable children proximate to you and those who your actions, whether very abstract to you or not, affect in another part of the world or another part of your country. Um, if we're not cultivating that on a spiritual level, if we're not teaching about that, if we're not talking about the fact that we cannot primarily protect our own family, our own interests, our own way of life, but that we should be intimately, like deeply concerned with protecting children who are not our biological children or our nuclear children. If that doesn't start in the church, it, it's no wonder that when it would really hurt you politically or hurt you materially to stand up for children who are being forcibly separated from their parents at the border, that you wouldn't have the resources to do it because you haven't been properly formed by the church into the kind of person who thinks of those children as your responsibility as well. And that's the kind of small thing that if you feel helpless about this thing that has already happened, that's something to look in your own community and think, are we being formed into the kind of people who see hurting vulnerable people in our community and think there's no such thing as other people's children? Those are my responsibility too, to care for and protect. Uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't be as disturbing if Trump wasn't likely running for president again, and if he wasn't the likely Republican nominee, if he does run, and if he hadn't already said that he would like to replace a lot of the you know middle managers in the bureaucracy with more Trumpy people, and these were the people that were standing up against him. You know, these were the people that were telling him, "Sir, you can't do that. That would be you know illegal or unethical or inhumane." Um, and many of them lost their jobs for standing up because you didn't want that around. So <laughs> J.D. Vance, quote about, about J.D. Vance saying, if Trump wins in 2024, I've already told him he should fire every bureaucrat in Washington and replace them all with our people. This is something that we have to speak out about because yeah. it's... <clears throat> The church can't be on the wrong side of this again. It just can't. Sorry. Okay. Do we have a guest, Guy? We do. And uh, it's all about how to be a good patriot. Okay. 
that confuses me, but I'll have to listen to find <laughs> out how I'm going to be a good patriot. Okay. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. We're going to keep bringing you the stories that other people might not want to bring you because it makes people mad. But we don't care. Do we, Sky? We don't care. We just don't. It's because we care, Phil. Oh, it's because we care. We do care. We care so much. That's why we bring you the stories that make people mad. Okay. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Guy. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next week. This episode is being brought to you by With God Daily, my daily devotional for people who hate daily devotionals. Most devotionals are sentimental and uncritical. They might make you smile, but they rarely make you think. With God Daily is different. It's written to engage your heart as well as your mind. And it does that by using theology, history, culture, and even science to illuminate your life with God. Each devotional also includes scripture readings and an historic prayer of the church. Right now in With God Daily, we're doing a series about the cross. We're examining different theories about Jesus' death and even looking at some of the more controversial issues out there right now, like does the doctrine of substitutionary atonement make God into some kind of cosmic child abuser? Was animal sacrifice in the Old Testament immoral? And why do Catholics and Protestants think of the cross so differently? If those are the kinds of issues you want to engage every day with accessible writing and an occasional doodle, then you should sign up for With God Daily. To join, just visit withgoddaily.com. You'll get an email devotional five days a week, plus the audio devotional, and you can download the mobile app for a better user experience and access to the archives. With God Daily is available to anyone who makes a donation of any amount. So go to withgoddaily.com and discover the daily devotional for people who hate daily devotionals. My guest today is a true elder and statesman of evangelicalism. Dr. Richard Mao is the former president of Fuller Theological Seminary and is currently a senior research fellow at the Henry Institute for the Study of Religion and Politics at Calvin University. He's authored more than 20 books, including Uncommon Decency and Adventures in Evangelical Civility, both of which tackle what it means for Christians to live faithfully in our pluralistic culture. He's taken up that issue again in his new book, How to Be a Patriotic Christian, Love of Country as Love of Neighbor. Given the deep divisions today and even the way some Christians want to take rights away from those they disagree with, as you heard about in the first half of this show, we need the wisdom and words of godly leaders like Dr. Mao in the church more than ever. That's why I was delighted to talk with him, and I hope that you're challenged and encouraged by our conversation. Here is Dr. Richard Mao. Dr. Mao, welcome to the Holy Post. I'm so grateful for your time. Great to be with you. Thank you. I'm honored to be. Over the course of your career, you've written a lot about civil engagement. What does it mean to be a Christian living in a, our society? And your newest book, How to Be a Patriotic Christian, Love of Country as Love of Neighbor, kind of comes at a really interesting time when there is a significant amount of debate going on about what does it really mean to be faithful in this country. I want to begin with um, a comment you make somewhat later in the book, where you talk about how it's increasingly difficult to have conversations within evangelical communities around this topic. And in some cases, it's actually easier to talk, what does it mean to be an American with people outside of the church? Why do you think it's become such a contentious issue within evangelicalism? Well, you know, I mean, if you contrast, say, say I'm having a dialogue with a Muslim scholar, uh, Neither of us really expect to change the other person's mind. And so I don't feel like a big failure if at the end he still denies the reality of the triune God and Jesus as the one who died on the cross for us. Uh, it's more of a dialogue, and we can uh, agree to disagree. Whereas with evangelicals, uh, everything is at stake, you know. Uh, mm. We, we really feel like I've got to represent my small <laughs> subgroup within the evangelical community. Uh, the whole future of our movement is at stake. Uh, and we have to decide which of us is really speaking the truth in obedience to the will of God. And so there's, there's so much. It, it has a lot to do with, with the... Uh, uh, the kind of the debates that we have within churches over things like sexuality, you know, 
there's a vote coming. And if I don't win the argument, then the vote's going to go the other way. And uh, so often we have this feeling there's a vote coming. At least there's a vote coming at the, the final judgment. You know? <laughs> so, so much more that's at stake. It's the future. I've heard this over and over again with more uh, fundamentalist folks. You know, we're fighting for the future of our movement. We're fighting for the sake of God's truth. And, uh, and it's the fighting part that's really a big part of it. Indeed. Um, it, you, you frame the book at the beginning as trying to navigate between two extremes. On one extreme, the more conservative extreme, you have Christian nationalism. The other extreme, which is more often associated with the progressive end of the political spectrum, is this um, complete condemnation of America and its sinfulness and its failures. Let me begin with the, the other side, though. How do you, how do you define Christian nationalism? Well, it's the sense that <clears throat> there is an intimate relationship between God and our country, and that our American exceptionalism, we call it. It's the idea that our country, in contrast to uh, other countries, was founded on Christian principles, but also founded in order to, to show the world what it's like for a nation to be living in complete will of God. You know, the Chronicles passage often goes, if my people who are called by my name, you know, and of course that's to Israel. Uh, it's to the church. But the fact is that it gets applied to the United States. My people who are called by God's name. And, uh, and so we have a special status uh, in the presence of God, but we also have a special calling, but the calling is to bring the will of God into conformity, to, uh, the, our nation's conformity to, in all of its ways. Uh, so then on the other end of the spectrum are those who want to just condemn the United States for its failures, for its history of racism, for abuses of power, both at home and around the world. And you argue that's not a faithful response either, because ultimately, we are called to a form of patriotism or neighborly love. That's ultimately, you ground it in, in very familial language, even going to the, to the Ten Commandments and the command to love our mother and father. Can you explain the, the link between a healthy form of patriotism and those biblical commands about honoring our elders or our parents? Yeah, right, because, you know, that word honor, First Peter 3, is applied to the nation in which Christians find themselves. We're to honor the emperor. We're to honor our fellow citizens. And, uh, and we're to show forth good deeds in, in, you know, in their midst. And, uh, and, and, of course, honor our parents. And, and it really has to do with... Uh, the fact that in a family, for example, uh, I can love my parents more than I love yours, you know, because they're my parents. And that means that God has placed me in that relationship. And it's okay to have a, a very strong affection to, for my parents, for my children, for my wife. Uh, and, and so that, that kind of honoring is, is a good thing. Now, I think the family illustrates things very nicely in that uh, honor doesn't mean to make an idol, you know, an idol out of my family. I can think that my family has a lot of flaws and even, even can be quite dysfunctional. But nonetheless, there's still a special relationship to where God has placed me and where God has placed you, and uh, and and again, it's it, it's a, it's a love. You can have a love for your own family. You can have a very strong love for your own country. You can have a love for the the flag of your country. Uh, but you, it's not an idolatrous thing. It's it's always recognizing that these things can lure us into a kind of uh, uh, strong. Uh, attachment 
that actually rivals what we owe to God and to God alone. Yeah, in that section early in the book where you're talking about the connection between family, love, and patriotism, you have, <laughs> you have this cheeky comment where you say, um, but my mother, my mother commanded no armies. She did not use guns and bombs to defend her right to be called the best mother in the world. And there you're contrasting the fact that a disordered affection for our nation or for our country can lead to some pretty terrible things because this idolatrous love of country and when linked to military force and the course of power of government can do an enormous amount of destructive harm. Um, I want to talk about, you have this wonderful section where you unpack a number of biblical passages that often get brought up in these conversations about patriotism. And I especially want to talk about your understanding of Romans 13, because that text gets cited all the time by people who are trying to um, defend obedience to government authorities. What are the limitations on that obedience as you read Romans 13 and understand that text? Right. You know, it, it's because <clears throat> I believe that Paul in Romans 13 is actually saying more about God's purposes for government than our obligations to government. I mean, and, and the, the, the marvelous example, of it, you know, you know it well. I mean, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, went to his death because he opposed the existing authorities, Hitler's government. And if, uh, you know, you can have some fun with this and talking to audiences, go through Romans 13 and, uh, and put Hitler's name in place of uh, the powers that be, you know. Uh, that therefore, our, Hitler is there for our good because he is... Uh, the one who rewards those who do good and punishes those who do evil. And if you disobey Hitler, uh, you're disobeying the will of God. Well, that just doesn't work. Because what's really going on there is that God is saying a key purpose for which God has ordained or instituted governments is that they reward those who do good and they punish those who do evil. And given that, if you have a government that rewards those who do evil and punishes those who do good, that government is living in disobedience to its ordination, <laughs> ordained purposes, you know. And uh, that seems obvious to me. That It's telling us that God has ordained government for certain purposes. And Paul is saying a normally functioning government there that rewards those who do good, punishes those who are evil, is one that we need to give our honor, our obedience to in many ways. Is, is another way of saying that, um, that the government has been given authority by God, obviously, to wield the sword and to um, function in certain ways, which we can get into in a moment. But one authority the government does not have is it does not get to define what is good and evil. That comes right. from God, and so we are held to that standard regardless of the government that we are under. At one point in the book, in the middle of it, I found this really interesting seg- section where you talk about the scope of government. And it, it, it jumped out to me because we recently we had a conversation on this podcast about the way that an awful lot of white evangelicalism in the United States has been so uh, enmeshed with conservative Republican political perspectives ever, I mean, for decades, but really the, the the Reagan era brought that marriage together. And there is this strong streak within a lot of white evangelicalism that believes, I think it was Reagan who said the government that governs best is that which governs least. The small government, there's very few things that especially the federal government should be involved in. But you make the case here from scripture that there's actually a more robust purpose for government given from the Bible than just, say, national defense. Can you share a little bit about not only the biblical vision of the proper role of government, but then how you saw that applied? For example, you talked about the Presbyterians in Scotland and elsewhere who took some of those values and created a sort of political philosophy, a Christian political philosophy for philosophy from them. And how does it stand in contrast to the small government, libertarian um, instinct that seems so prevalent in evangelicalism today? 
point. Well, it's, it really comes down to this, that government, I believe from a biblical perspective, doesn't just have a negative role, but it's to, to keep, you know, to, to, to just not, not interfere too much in our lives. Government is called by God to have a kind of positive role of, of promoting human flourishing. And uh, that flourishing has a kind of, uh, I like the idea here, of a nurturing aspect, you know. Psalm 72 says, Give the king thy justice, O God. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. So there's a kind of protecting there of, of the vulnerable and promoting justice. And then this wonderful line, uh, may the, the governing of a, of a proper government, a proper king, or in our case, a proper uh, democratic uh, republic government, uh, may, that, may the policies of that government come down as, as rain upon the new, newly mown grass, you know? But there's a kind of nurturing, growing uh, function there. And the Scottish Presbyterians picked this up from this kind of obscure reference that in Isaiah 60, for example, that we shall suck the breasts of kings. And I say that's probably not something you'd put on your church bulletin board, but um, there's a kind of nurturing there that government does. It takes care of us in certain ways. It provides things that are, are good for us. And, and so it isn't just that the government has the sword to punish those who do evil, but it has a kind of calling to promote the good. And we, we acknowledge that with the safety net thing, that uh, at the very least the government has to be there when, when people aren't protected, when people don't have uh, health care or don't have uh, enough to live on. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it is a, a nurturing kind of thing that I think we need to take seriously. And then once we establish that, we sit down and we think, well, what are some of the things? That, I mean, why do we have uh, government-funded uh, parks? You know? uh, should a government provide parks or recreational areas? Should it provide libraries, city libraries? And I, I want to jump quickly into that when I'm arguing with people who say the government that governs the least. So that means you want to do away with public libraries, you know, because they don't have to do that. And it, you know, but I, I do think that there are things like libraries, and there are things like, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, food programs for the hungry and the like, yeah. This is an area that I find intriguing because I f maybe my perspective is skewed, but it feels to me like some years ago, I was more likely to get in conversations or healthy debates around politics with people who, who agree that the government ought to be promoting the common good or nurturing uh, the well-being of society. And the disagreement was over the best strategies for that, the best programs for that, where those things should be enacted at a federal level, state level, local level. And that seemed to be where American politics had its divisions was just the right way to implement this shared goal. But increasingly, even among Christians, I'm hearing a very different argument right now, where it's not that the government should be promoting the common good, but there's a whole faction of people who are basically arguing the government should have no involvement. And, and some people are saying that, yeah, there shouldn't be publicly funded libraries and parks and some of these, and schools for that matter. And it seems like our politics and our rhetoric is going more and more extreme where there's a fundamental breakdown in, in a shared vision of what government's for, let alone the specifics of how it should be doing that. So where do you think that impulse is coming from, especially among evangelicals? Why do you think that that extremist view is, is finding more traction than perhaps in the past? Yeah. Well, I, I really think, you know, here we need to take the, the kind of a historical perspective. Uh, 
I was interviewed several months ago by a writer for The Economist who called me and said, you know, I don't know much about religion and I don't know much about Mormonism, but I understand you know things about this. So he said, uh, "Here's a, I'm thinking about writing a column on the fact that Mormons in public life seem a lot nicer than evangelicals. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, can you, you, you help me think this through? And so we had a wonderful conversation. And, and it came down to this, at least in my mind. You know, up until about the mid-19th century, we evangelicals kind of owned the country, you know. It was God's country. Um, we could talk about our, our nation under God and that kind of thing and really mean it. And uh, we just had a sense that we were in control of the public discourse and, and talk about the, the purposes of government and life. And then it began to, the, 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 the Darwinian crisis that later led to the, the trial with William Jennings Bryan kind of thing. And they, they began to take our government away. That historian George Marsden says, you know, that evangelicals from going from the 19th century to the 20th century uh, went through a kind of immigration experience. We went mm. from a familiar land to an unfamiliar land. They have taken away my country, and I do not know where they have laid it, uh, kind, kind of thing. And so we, ha we experience a real sense of loss. And, and I think that these days, it's almost like this government has been given over to another, another force, and it's an evil force, secularism, secular humanism, uh, atheism. And uh, the least they can do to us, the best. <laughs> uh, whereas Mormons were, were actually kind of marginalized and even persecuted. I mean, you know, it was a Christian vigilante that killed Joseph Smith in jail. Uh, they, they've always put themselves on the, on, the, uh, on the edges of things. And in recent years, certainly with the with the nomination of Mitt Romney, uh, they felt more a part of things, and they're glad to have a place at the table, whereas we evangelicals feel like it's a very different table and we don't like it. And so the more we can limit the impact that this government has on us, and of course, we're not very careful thinkers about this. You know, someone once mm. pointed out, and we, we hear this again, Recently, you don't get any evangelical Supreme Court justices, you know, because we're not known for having a philosophy of government uh, that has any coherence. And so, you know, we, we, I, I really think this is a very important for the dialogue today. We're, we're a people. The evangelical movement is a people who have experienced a tremendous sense of loss. And we grieve, and then we get angry. You know, you can almost do that with the stages of grieving. Uh, but unless we get back to the sense of loss and the grieving and promoting a real sense of how do we live with people with whom we disagree uh, in the current pluralistic society in which we find ourselves, we're never, not going to get very far. I, I could not agree with you more. And in fact, I've written some pieces about trying to understand the current evangelical movement through the the stages of grief. And w one of the things that I, I I think there's legitimate grief there because there is a legitimate degree to which evangelicals have lost authority and power, both culturally and politically, in the country. But what's exacerbating it? Many of our leaders, both inside and outside the church, the political leaders, appealing to evangelical supporters and some evangelical leaders themselves, church leaders and others, are inflating the perception of loss and inflating the grief and the fear as a way of motivating people, which is not helping. <laughs> it's in fact, uh, it's counterproductive to actually moving through those stages of grief where you get to a place of resolution. And one way that happens is um, 
is the use of patriotic symbols in our worship and in our churches. And you have a whole chapter on this, chapter seven, you talk about patriotism in the church. And by the time I got to that part of your book, I mean, you'd won me over before I picked up your book because I knew your perspective on a lot of things. And and the book only reinforced that, your your commitment to pluralism, listening to people of divergent thinking, uh, a mature form of, of love of country rather than a, a naive or juvenile one. So by the time I got to this chapter, I was like, okay, I can't wait to hear what Dr. Mao says about patriotic hymns and flags in church because he's going he's gonna to really come down hard on that. And you <laughs> didn't. In fact, you, you gave a sense, uh, sort of an apologetic for why and how it might be okay to have some of these nationalistic symbols in our worship spaces or even in our singing. Um, caught me off guard, to be honest. Explain what you think is a proper use of those things in the church or how you've advised or coached Christian leaders, church leaders, in the best way to utilize those symbols and what you think is a detrimental or harmful way to utilize them. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I, you know, there was an anonymous reader of the original manuscript of my book that said, uh, if he doesn't take that chapter out of there, uh, this book's going to be a disaster. You know? <laughs> but, you know, under, underlying what I'm trying to get at is the teaching ministry of the church. I had a, I had a, I was speaking to a conference in the, of pastors right before the last election, the presidential election, and a, and a minister stood up in the Q and A period and says, "You know, I've never preached a political sermon in my life, and I probably never will again. But this Trump guy is so bad that I've got to one Sunday just tell my people what I think of him." And he said, do you have a comment on that? I said, yeah, well, congratulations. I hope you really feel good after preaching that sermon. But if you've never preached on politics before and you never plan to again, this is all about you and your feelings. You know, hmm. uh, you're not going to accomplish anything. Uh, we have a teaching ministry about this. And I think for where we are today as an evangelical movement signals uh, a great failure in our teaching ministry. And so Amen. people say, I just can't stand any mention of patriotism in church. Well, I did a study of, right, went through all of those patriotic hymn songs uh, before I started writing the book, you know, and as I point out, they, they really boil down to, there are three things that we love by, about our country as comes through in those songs. The one is the tremendous natural resources, you know, the Purple Mountains majesty, majesty and uh, fields of grain and uh, rocks and rills and all the rest. And that's a great thing, you know. We have a wonderful country in terms of natural resources. Secondly, uh, our history, you know, and again, w without getting into the details of things, I'm glad that our flag was still there in the morning. You know, I can sing the Star Spangled Banner in the sense that there were acts of heroism and, and all the rest that took place. And I'm glad that, that I, I look at Iwo Jima photograph and, and that's fine. I honor those people who fought for our freedoms. And then, and so there are things about our past that aren't all bad. I mean, there are some good things. And then thirdly, and, and incidentally, we don't, I mean, the Pilgrim's Pride may be a little bit, that, that may need some exegesis, some interpretation. <laughs> but generally, you know, it's, it's not all that bad. And then thirdly, there are the ideals, you know, liberty and law. There are also prayers to God that we, he help us to mend our every flaw, you know. That we can't sing that we love America without wanting to love the America that has flaws, and we sing that with a desire to mend those. So the patriotic songs aren't all that bad. And the minister I quote in the book, you know, he says, well, I finally got through Memorial Day weekend, now I've got to face the 4th of July. You know, if on Memorial Day weekend, he'd say, you know, we just sang that song. And isn't it wonderful that we as believers 
can pray to the God of the scriptures that he mend our flaws so that God would shed his grace on our country because we can't do it on our own. You know, there's a lot of teaching, good theological teaching that we can engage in there. And uh, it's the failure of that teaching. And again, the uh, that Robert Bella essay that I quote on the civil religion, I mean, the way Lincoln uh, talked about the will of God, the fact that in the beginning and the middle and the end of John F. Kennedy's speech, he, he appealed to the will of God that transcends our own sense of what's right and wrong. And that, that that's what we're accountable to. Those are preachable moments. They're teachable moments. And just to say, well, I don't want anything to do with that. That's just patriotism. I think is wrong. Martin Luther King, so, as I point out in the book, just quoted all that stuff in favor of civil racial justice. You know? I, I agree. I, two points that um, one one area of agreement and one area where I want to challenge you a little bit. The area of agreement, I I I felt for a long time that a lot of the captivity in the white evangelical church to politics is the result of in a way, pastoral malpractice. The fact that we don't talk about politics or what does it mean to be a faithful Christian in this society, the citizenship requirements we have, we don't talk about that area of discipleship in our churches. We essentially surrender that then to the media and to public voices in politics. And to your point, if we engaged these teaching opportunities more, what does it mean to be an American? How do we think about the flag as a Christian? How do we think about the civil religion of our of our history and the positives of that, the negatives of that? If we actually discipled people in those things, then this wouldn't be as problematic as it is. And so when I read your chapter, I was like, yeah, amen, I, I agree. And the way you describe uh, possibly engaging the flag on a national holiday from a pastor's point of view explain both the positives and the temptations that are there, I would love to see that in a church setting. So I'm with you. I agree 100%. Here's my pushback. I think so much of white evangelicalism has such a an idolatrous relationship with the United States and Christian nationalism and the flag that I think we need to be a bit wiser about where those symbols and what role they play in our gatherings. It's a little bit like it's a little bit like alcohol. In my understanding of of scripture, my understanding of Christian doctrine, I don't think there is any prohibition against drinking alcohol for a Christian. There is of course a prohibition against drunkenness. And if I were ministering with a community of recovering alcoholics, I probably wouldn't serve alcohol at that gathering. I probably wouldn't use real wine at communion because I'd be sensitive to the unique history and temptation that this community has experienced in its past. And that's a little bit how I feel about white evangelical communities. There's so much abuse and idolatry of nationalism and patriotism in an unhealthy way. I'm not convinced that singing patriotic hymns and having American symbols and flags in worship is the is a good, healthy first step in bringing them to a, a more mature form of civil engage, civic engagement, the way you describe in the book. That's my only hesitation with the way I see it played out in a lot of our churches. <laughs> I love, I love what you're saying. I mean, and I'm sure that uh, there are a lot of church services that we could attend where we feel we're there with a bunch of drunks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, think of this, and, and I agree with you, I agree with you, but here you have a congregation of people like that, and you've got the flag there. Just to take it out is going to make it even worse. <laughs> True. Um, so all I'm saying is if it's there, I do not, I would not, if I were building a church and decorating it, as it were, I would not put an American flag in there. Uh, I, I agree with you. But the fact is, in a lot of churches, they're there. And then you have to think about what, what, what happens to the authority of the Word of God when you actually say, we've got to take this out. You know, and that minister is done. I mean, in a lot of churches, that minister is done. Uh, 
So I, I agree with you, but, you know, at that point, I think you can't really deal with people's inordinate affection and idolatrous attachment to the flag until you've done a lot of other work. And I'm, I'm you know, I talk about the catechesis, the, not just memorizing catechism questions, but the, the teaching ministry of the church. And that means that we, it isn't just all a 20-minute sermon. We need to think about what we do on, on Wednesday nights. You know, can we have people come and, and, uh, and study uh, things? And suppose you had a class on patriotism. And you actually said, you know, there's, there's some good things about patriotism. Let's study those hymns that we associate with patriotism. Uh, let's look at the history of our country and try to do it in a fair and an honest way uh, where we acknowledge the good things as well, you know. But I think there's a teaching ministry that's prior to con con condemning things. And here's I, where I, I, would, I, you know, I, I agree entirely. Going. And if, if if a church leader is going to do a class like that, I would recommend that they also include your book as part of that curriculum, How to Be a Patriotic Christian, for sure. Um, okay. Dr. Mao, I mean, your your answer, honestly, about uh, the hymns and the flag and all that in the church, I think it just speaks to the pastoral wisdom that you're bringing into this issue, as you do with all these others. You have experience and wisdom and a, and a level of maturity that recognizes it's not just about affirming or condemning, but it's moving people along, guiding them in the right direction of maturity in Christ. And I appreciate your wisdom in this book. I think it would have been far easier if I had hit that chapter and you just wrote about, yeah, this is wrong, don't do it. Instead, you offer real um, nuanced wisdom here. And that permeates the whole book. And it's permeated your whole ministry and your career. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your wisdom in this book and many others that I've read over the years. I've, I've benefited greatly from it. I know our audience has as well. Thank you for being with us. Well, I've, I've learned from you as well, and I'm, I'm very grateful for your ministry. God bless. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash Holy Post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit HolyPost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.